yeah, a pristine reef is like a landscape of here. You have all these big animals, the sharks, the snappers, the groupers, the big mouths. And the smaller fish, the prey of all these predators, are really scared. They are hiding. And this is the same thing that happened in Yellowstone National Park when the wolves were reintroduced in 95. And before that, the deer were grazing all around. They were destroying the forest little by little. But when wolves were reintroduced, then the fear came to the deer and the deer are not eating uh, so much. They are, you know, the, the forests are coming back. So having the predators there is good for the ecosystem. It brings balance to the ecosystem. Yeah, almost nobody alive remembers what the ocean used to be like, you know, the virgin healthy ocean. And we have totally changed it. Back then, you know, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, the water was clear and full of large fish, large predators, like sharks and groupers and snappers, cod. But we have removed 90% of these large predators from the ocean in the last you know, the last century. And right now what we have is water that is not so clear because of all the pollution and all the runoff from the land. And most of the fishes are small. We have replaced the large animals with small fish and microbes and jellyfish. Our impact in the ocean depends on what type of fish we eat. And removing a tuna from the ocean has a larger impact than removing an anchovy, for example. And this is why. At the base of the food chain we have plants that are eaten by small animals that in turn are eaten by, are eaten by anchovies, which in turn are eaten by larger fish and tuna. So anchovies, let's say that an anchovy requires one hectare per year to survive, one acre per year to survive. And that a tuna requires 10,000 anchovies per year to survive. So the footprint of the tuna up on the food chain is much greater than the footprint of the anchovy at the bottom of the food chain. So as we go up on the food chain, as we approach the top predators, the greater the, the footprint is. So we should try to reduce our consumption of the big guys up the food chain because we are taking too much of the productivity of the ocean. This week, a few organizations met here in Washington. Conservation organizations, philanthropists, scientists, industry, and all agreed that we need more collaboration. We need to work together more strongly if we really want to move the dial in ocean conservation much faster. So this coalition, this new network is called Mission Blue. Now it's the leaders of ocean conservation, ocean stakeholders who really want to make a difference by working together real after realizing that working alone, we are not going to make it. And we are launching uh, also a campaign called I Am The Ocean, where we want people to realize that the ocean is intimately linked to them, that everybody is part of the ocean, and the ocean makes this planet so such a wonderful place to live. So if you go to iamtheocean.org, you will be able to see what the coalition is about and also how you can help. You talk about the coalition. It put me in mind of a question that someone posted on our Facebook page. We let our Facebook fans know that this event was taking place this afternoon, and we invited them to ask questions. And a number of people did. Um, uh, one person, Michelle Brown, posted a question. What organization is responsible for looking out for our ocean? There is no single organization that is looking after the ocean. No. The ocean is like the last frontier. Governments, you know, federal governments, regional governments, local governments, uh, fisheries management organizations. You know, in the United States, for example, every department except the Department of Veterans has some stake in the ocean. This is why President Obama has established the National Ocean Policy with the goal of bringing everything that is ocean related under one single umbrella. Because right now there are too many cooks in the kitchen. Right? So what we need to do is to all together, instead of working in a fragmented way, come together to work together to solve the problems much faster. Because time is short. Mm -hmm. George Young Cotwell asks, can the ocean recover itself naturally if pollution is stopped? Or does cleaning need to be done manually? And if so, how? The ocean always recovers 
if we give it the chance. The best example is marine protected areas, these reserves that we set aside with no fishing and the fish, the marine life comes back. And within a few years, three, five, seven years, we can, we can tell the difference. It is too late for some species that ha have gone extinct, but most of the species are still in the sea, so we have a chance to recover them. Dead zones are areas on the coast that have almost no oxygen. And most of these areas, like this big area on the mouth of the Mississippi, are caused by all the agricultural and sewage runoff that comes from upstream from the land. And so we can see, you can see that agriculture in the Midwest, in the United States, it's a huge problem for the marine ecosystem in the Gulf. The problem is that we have, they still don't have an integrated management of our entire continent or our entire country. So it's about time that there are regulations, you know, agricultural regulations, you know, use of fertilizer, for example, that are implemented, taking into account the impact of these uh, fertilizers uh, downstream you know, in the Gulf of Mexico marine ecosystem. Unfortunately, there are no attempts at such scale yet to integrate our upstream activities with what happens in the ocean. Uh, Svetlana Melnichek wonders, can fish be bred in, in say, fish farms, you know, bred and released into the wild to supplement the supplies? Mm. Fish farms are very important to complement the wild catch because the fish that the catch that we got from the ocean peaked in the late 80s and it's been declining since. We cannot take more fish than we're taking now from the ocean. So aquaculture, fish farms are you know, increasing. So they are providing more and more and more protein. The problem is that we are taking fish from the sea to make fish meal to feed the fish in the farms. So it doesn't make any sense. And some ask if fish from fish farms could be released in the field you know, to um, replenish natural populations. And that would be very inefficient because it takes so much effort to raise these fish. And then these are fish that haven't grown in the wild. So putting them back in the ocean could have problems of interaction of diseases or parasites. So the best thing we can do is to reduce fishing pressure in the ocean. This is much more effective than trying to raise fish in a farm and then throwing them back in the water. If we set aside some protected areas, if we reduce the fishing capacity, if we take many boats out of the ocean, fishes will replenish themselves much more efficiently than if we are trying to engineer it. Mm. Everybody can help. You know, go to iamtheocean.org, iamtheocean.org, and find out how can you help.